All right, CNT 140. We're looking at Chapter 8 uh, on cabling for wireless networks. Um, now, they, they do focus a little bit on the cabling necessary for wireless networks, but they also spend some time reviewing some concepts about wireless networks. So, we'll, we'll, we'll glean out of it what we can. So, let's jump in here. Uh, first thing they talk about in their introduction is uh, wireless network standards are still evolving. Well, I, I'm going to remind you of your 8211 wireless standards, um, and I have links here to them, Wikipedia and the working group and so forth. Um, that is our predominant group for standardizing wireless networks and communication via wireless networks, Wi-Fi networks. Um, and even in here, I put on the next slide, I did a summary for you of kind of where we are now, the A, B, G, N, A, C standards. Uh, those are kind of the common ones that people are using right now. There's more being evolved. Uh, but I tried to grab this as a summary for you into a chart. This, is, this should be kind of useful for you. Looking back in time, uh, or, you know, late 90s, the A standard came out, B standard came out, and then we evolved in the early 2000s with G and AC. A lot of us are probably using N at home, maybe even into AC, but probably a lot of us are using N at home. Um, and then I, I pulled the stats out of the, the common things that you run into with these standards, including the frequency bands, uh, the frequency ranges used, the bandwidth of, uh, the data rate of, whether it's using NEMO or not. It's only really our N and AC standards, the latest ones that are using NEMO. And then the ranges of, the approximate ranges of these standards, indoor and outdoor. So use that as a reference. That'll be handy to kind of uh, keep your brain straight on the capabilities of each of these wireless standards. They mentioned the biggest concern is security. That is very true. Um, with, with the development of our wireless standards over the years have been the development of the um, encryption to go with that. Initially, WEP was used. Um, that has been deprecated because it is not secure enough. That's been crackable. Then they developed WPA to be used. Um, again, that has been compromised over time. Most things are using WPA2 and progressing into WPA3. These are a lot more secure, at least for now. Um, so this is something that has evolved with our standards along to allow them to be more secure. The other thing that's typically done, and the, the book didn't mention this, but... I will because we do this in our um, in our different CNT classes. Our APs are typically installed where they connect into a switch, into a switch port, and then we normally configure the switch with VLANs where the, the wired users are in one VLAN, the wireless users are in a different VLAN, and then we typically, on top of that, layer three IP scheme on top of that where the wired and wireless users are different subnets, which when you think to our other CNT classes, routers and firewalls can keep these subnets sorted through access lists to add to the security. So when they talk about wireless, um, the biggest concern is security, very true, but many things have evolved, including encryption of the wireless connections and how we connect the work, the, uh, the access points to the network. We have some mechanisms in place to secure the wireless networks as much as possible at this point. So they are correct, but there are some tricks that we're using now to to help with that. They mentioned that wireless is limited in its speed, um, hard to manage is subject to interference and expensive. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So first, um, limited connection speed, yes. But more recently, things like Nemo has made our bandwidth for wireless much greater and a lot more beneficial. So if I look back to our standards here, um, Data rates were usually in the 50 meg ballpark, um, sometimes about half of that because of range and distance. We're able to be pushing into the hundreds of megs and even into some basic gig ranges with our wireless, uh, uh, modern wireless standards. So we've come a long way on those. Um, and they talk about interference. Yes, building construction materials that are used in buildings can cause signal loss and interference. Absolutely. That has to be factored in with our wireless network. Um, Typically, actually, we'll, start, we'll talk about this later in the state surveys, but typically you'll install an access point and test it for what kind of range interference you have and make adjustments based on the construction of the building because some things are unpredictable on how they're going to react to wireless signals. Uh, and last but not least, expensive. Yeah, it, it costs money to install the APs and support them, uh, but it's usually at the, the value of adding mobility for users, you know, bringing laptops, bringing tablets, bringing smartphones, and also is um, for the benefit of, you think of schools and so forth where you have after school events, 
parents, visitors come, can connect to wireless networks, a guest wireless networks for internet connectivity, etc. So there is some benefits to it, um, mobility and that sort of things. They also mention that wireless is not wireless. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, I like how they say that. Indeed, access points do need to be installed to support wireless users, and your access points typically connect back to a switch and into the wired network. So there is a portion of my network that is still wired to get to the access point. So I, I grabbed a map that we had uh, looked at before. Here's a typical, you know, small business network map, if you will. ISP connection to a firewall, into a router, into a switch. We have IP phones and workstations plugged into the wired ports. My access points still cable into or plug into those switches. So there is still some wired infrastructure to go to the access points. Absolutely. And here's another example too. Same idea. Firewall, router, switch, workstations, IP phones. I still have access points cabled into uh, my switch. They also remind us that a wireless network diagram kind of looks like zone cabling. Uh, the final drop is replaced with a wireless link. Yeah, absolutely. So I grabbed another map here, internet, broadband router, router that you have at home. You have a couple workstations plugged in, maybe Xbox, that sort of thing. Um, the access point plugs into that switch. And then this final link, this would normally be a cabled run from the switch to laptop. But with the access point here, this final link is a wireless link. So that final drop is the wireless link. That final um, connection, if you will, is a wireless link. That's what they're getting at there. Then they mention um, about our access point, our hotspot in wireless antenna. So I'm, I'm going to fill in some gaps for you. Here's the kind of access point you would find in typical businesses. Okay. Um, these are typically mounted up in the ceiling and as I look at a lot of these access points this one's just a little older you see a lug on here that the antenna screws onto the dipole antenna screws onto they removed that so you can see it um, some of them here you actually can see the antenna is attached to the outside some of them, the antenna is actually internal to here so it's less um, less obvious or less obtrusive in some networks um, but that actually is the part that the signal is emanating from for users to connect to some of them, you know, if I look at this one again, this little screw lug, some of them I could even run a connection to an outside antenna. And actually, if you start looking at different places, you will often see this. You will see an outside antenna pointing in a directional manner to get, connect back to a building. Uh, not uncommon at all. Now, they didn't mention this, but I'm going to fill in for you real quick. Hopefully you remember this from uh, some, some chapter 6 and 120. Uh, our... The antennas are a factor in our wireless network too. A traditional dipole antenna just looks like the regular antenna like here. That's a dipole antenna. The dipole antenna has a radiation pattern that kind of reminds you of a little bit of like a squashed beach ball. Uh, the signal emanates in a spherical shape around it, a little bit squashed. Um, so is that if you look at this here, if I can imagine a beach ball coming out around here, it kind of balloons out on the area around it on that floor, if you will. Some above, some below, but it kind of tends to take that sphere shape around there. So if I have a regular dipole antenna on my access point, I'm going to get that much coverage area. That's what my coverage, coverage area is going to look like. Well, some access points I can actually, as we saw back here, this right here, I could actually unscrew that dipole and screw a different antenna type to it. Here's a different type of antenna. It's a patch array. This could be mounted on the wall, and as you see here, this is more directional. So if I were thinking of connecting a building to another building, I could be placing this that it's going to directionally point to another area or another zone uh, in my building. Here's even a different type of directional antenna. It looks similar to the one that was there, but this is more... more uh, uh, it's not quite as directional. It's more a uh, lobe here as you look. This would be mounted maybe outside of a building. This is a more, uh, again, kind of like a squashed uh, balloon where it's pointed in more, more in a, a focused manner. So the point I'm making here with these is, uh, with my access point, yes, um, here's typically a dipole on it, okay? But some of these actually have that lug on that I can change my antenna style to change my coverage area. So, kind of filling in more than the book did here, my antenna plays a key role in my access point and what kind of coverage I'm going to get. So, if you have access points that you can change the antenna, that could be beneficial when you're trying to cover distinct areas of a building, a distinct uh, 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 area that you're trying to cover with wireless. 
They then go on to talk a little bit more about access points and say that the radio transceivers and network adapters uh, need to match for communication. Yeah, now they use the example of like an old PCMCIA card and a laptop. Not very common anymore. Um, so let's just go through this idea real quick. Uh, I grabbed this picture. This was like an ad for, I think, this this router. Regardless, they're showing this router here using a, a wireless in-home router, and then they're showing different types of adapters around the house that are all using wireless end to connect to that. Yeah, um, typically when you're going to connect an access point to a workstation, the adapter in the workstation and the access point, their standards need to match so they can communicate. Um, some of our access points are capable of multiple standards, and I think I have that on another example here for you. Yeah, here you go. This access point here, as I look at it, is capable of A, B, G, and N. Um, now, there's pros and cons to that, but at least in a compatibility sake, any device that has A, B, G, or N in would be able to connect to this access point. Now, sometimes what does happen is if you connect with an older standard, um, you get less bandwidth, obviously, and sometimes it slows down the other users, too. So that's kind of a, there's a good and a bad. It's more accessible, it's more usable, but it might have a drawback of affecting other users. Okay, be that as it may, coming back to our point, our access point here in this case is actually capable of a couple, same with this one here. This one's capable of a couple different standards to connect to. So if I have different network adapters and devices around my network, maybe laptops or uh, cards with laptops on or scanning units or checking in units or whatever that are running different standards, a good quality access point should be able to handle those and, and, and connect. Here is a, a wireless NIC showing you capability of ABG GNAC um, for connecting to different wireless networks. Okay. One of the next things they mentioned is access points have limited power and distance. Absolutely. They, they are not, you know, I cannot go forever, if you will. Uh, so I pull up our standard again, remind you that according to the standard, here is the ballpark ranges of these uh, of these standards. So most you're seeing are in the 35. We get a little bit higher with the end standard, but we're, we're typically in around like the 30 meter range, uh, which multiplied by about three feet per meter. You're talking about 90, 100 feet kind of thing. So significant indoor, a little bit more outdoor because there's less obstacles to absorb the signal, less things to reflect the signal. So it's not super far, uh, but but I have a little bit of distance, but it, it is limited. I cannot go um, great distances. And again, I remind you, your antenna design or your antenna is a factor in what kind of area or what kind of distance you get out of your access point. Dipole, patch arrays, directionals, etc. They all affect my, affect my range and my coverage area. If I do a directional, uh, some of the energy that would normally have been over here gets kind of redirected this way so I get more range this way. That's the idea behind it. Okay, I'm going to pause here. When I come back uh, on the next podcast, we'll pick up here.